today what I want to do primarily is to review the material, specifically the material on interval estimation by looking specifically and in detail at assignment 5. Um, but before I do that, let me ask, are there any questions dealing with experimental error, dealing with, that is, type 1 and type 2 errors? Um, well, um, I've kind of had a bit of trouble with it. Um, I just um, was wondering, because, I mean, uh, type 1 error has to do with failing to reject the null hypothesis or rejecting it. I'm just... Well, you, you should be sure at least of that. <laughs> um, because we went through this 2 by 2 model, if you recall, in which we distinguished between the researcher's decision and what is actually the case, what we might call what is true. <coughs> the researcher must decide, I, I've, I've said all this, I don't think there's much point in writing any of this down. I think you're better off just looking at it as we go through. The researcher must do one of two things, we agreed, at the end of the analysis. The researcher must either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. I ought to uh, confiscate all pens and pencils because I can't imagine that I haven't said this before. Um, we also observed that in regard to what is actually the case, the null hypothesis is either true or the null hypothesis is false. And we then set up this two by two. <coughs> when re researchers reject a false null hypothesis, everything's fine. When they fail to reject a true null hypothesis, everything is fine. Problems occur in these two other quadrants. When researchers reject a true null hypothesis, they've committed a type 1 or alpha error. So that the only type of error that one can commit when one rejects the null hypothesis is a type 1 error. When researchers fail to reject a false null hypothesis, they've committed a type 2 or beta error. That is the only error one can commit when failing to reject the null hypothesis is a type 2 error. A type 1 error is a false conclusion of difference and a type 2 error is a false conclusion of no difference. The part of this puzzle that is most explicitly under the control of the researcher is alpha, the willingness to commit type 1 error. And as I've indicated, by convention in the social sciences at least, and in communication in particular, researchers set alpha equal to 0 0.05 or 0 0.01, most typically 0 0.05. That is, they take a, they admit to a 5 in 100 likelihood that any statement of difference they make is a false statement of difference. Okay. Are there any other questions dealing with type 1 and type 2 errors? No. Hearing none, Let's go on. Let's, let's take a look then at specifically at assignment five. Uh, you were required in or asked in assignment five or given the opportunity in assignment five, I don't, I don't know, um, to answer seven questions and in each case compute the 95% and 99% confidence interval. And um, let me just go through these, and, and, and I'm not going to bother with 
any of the 99% confidence intervals. It's simply a difference between multiplying by, on the one hand, 1.96, and on the other, 2.50. <coughs> so that, that's a trivial, trivial difference, and it's a consistent difference. And nor am I going to go through the keystroking. You know, the, the, that's that's trivial too. But but getting to the the answer, or getting to a, into a position where you can keystroke and get the answer is, is, I think, much more important. Question one says, a researcher randomly selects a sample of 686 students. That is, N equals 686. With a mean GPA, or the, rather it says the mean GPA of the sample is 2.47. That is, X bar, or sometimes we've called it M, is 2.47. And the standard deviation of the population, that is sigma, known from repeated sampling is 2.22. Estimate the population mean. That is, you're trying to estimate mu. I presume that, well, let me ask, would you all agree that we're in situation one here? We looked at three situations in the context of interval estimation. And the first of those was a situation in which n was large, that is in, in excess of 100, which is the case here. Sigma was known, and it's known here, and you were estimating mu, which is the case here. And in that instance, the estimate of mu was given by the point estimate x bar plus and minus some z-score that is a function of the confidence level. If 95% confidence level, this z-score is 1.96, and if 99% is 2.58, multiplied by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means, which, according to central limit theorem, is sigma over the square root of n. Are there any questions to this point? Either in how we determine which situation we're in or why this formula is then appropriate to that situation? No? Then it's merely putting, placing in the values here. X bar is 2.47 plus and minus, if this is a 95% confidence estimate, Z is 1.96, multiplied by sigma, which is 2.22, divided by the square root of N, which is 686. Are there any questions? The answers to these are appended to uh, assignment five. There are no questions? Then let's pass on to question two. Assume that the researcher in question one did not know the population standard deviation. That is, we don't know sigma but did know that the standard deviation of the sample was 2.94. That is, we do know that S is 2.94. And now you're asked again to estimate the population mean. Would you agree that this is situation two? A situation in which N is large, sigma is unknown, and you're estimating mu. The only difference in this situation is that the estimate of mu, again, is x bar plus and minus some z-score, multiplied by now the estimate of the uh, standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which would be s divided by the square root of n minus 1, rather than n because you're correcting for bias. So the only difference in the estimate would be in this section, which instead of being 
2.22 divided by the square root of 686, which is n, would be s, which is 2.94, divided by the square root of n minus 1, which is 685. So it would be 2.47 plus and minus 1.96 multiplied by 2.94 over the square root of 685. Are there any questions? We're a subdued crowd. Are we on our way to Iraq? Where did S come from? Where did what come from? S, the sample. You're told in the question that, assume, the question reads, assume that the researcher in question one did not know the population standard deviation, but did know that the standard deviation of the sample, that is S, was 2.94. In case you didn't read or see it, I do want you to know that we in Kingwood are seeking to identify the enemy and send them back home. A group of Kingwood Nazi Nazis went out under the cover of night, apparently a couple of evenings ago, discovered the house of a French woman who's lived in Kingwood for 20 years, defaced her house, and in part told her to go back to France. That's what makes things great. Are they doing that to the English people too? Or? Well, I guess they won't because we're supporting the United States after all. So, so I think that uh, I'm safe, but I, I find this... If, if it... I don't know. If it doesn't, if it doesn't make you sick, there's something wrong out there. But... That's just my opinion, and I may be wrong. <laughs> but we do have things under control in Kingwood. We're ferreting out the enemy under cover of night. <coughs> so if I hear the standard issue knocking at my door in the middle of the night, I shan't answer. Let my 14-year-old dog go and answer. Question three. A researcher randomly selects a sample of 250 persons. That is, N equals 250. The mean amount of television viewing in the sample is 7.04 hours. That is, X bar is 7.04. And the standard deviation of the sample that is S, is 2.5. Estimate the population mean. We're in the same situation that we were in in question two. <coughs> this is situation two where N is large and sigma is unknown. So that the estimate of mu is the point estimate X bar, which equals, equals 7.04 rather, plus and minus some z-score that's a function of the confidence level. In this instance, if it's a 95% confidence level, 1.96, multiplied by s divided by the square root of n minus 1. And in this case, s is 2.5, and, and n minus 1 would be 249. Are there any questions on how you either A, determine which situation you're in, or B, determine the formula for the estimation? 
Let me then look very briefly at the remaining four questions, because the remaining four questions, I believe, all deal with um, situation three, which is a situation in which you're dealing with proportional data. In that situation, you're estimating P subscript U, the population proportion. And you do so in the same way as you estimate mu. You begin with the uh, point estimation, P subscript S, that is the sample proportion, plus and minus some z-score that's contingent on the confidence level, divided by the square root of 0.25 divided by n. This part of the puzzle is straightforward. The only two variables here are z, which is either 1.96 or 2.58, and n, which changes from question to question, sample size. I think the only confusing, potentially confusing issue in this context is identifying P subscript S. P subscript S can, I feel, I, I feel like uh, I'm suddenly reminded of the line from Ghostbusters when Gozar comes in three forms. P subscript S, like Gozar, can come in many forms. Here, three forms. Uh, first of all, it could appear as a proportion. Secondly, it could appear as a percentage. And third, it could appear as frequency data. However it appears, it has to be placed, converted into potentially proportional data. Yes. In question four, for example, you are told and it refers back to question three, where let's remember n was 250. You are told that assume that the researcher in question three also observes that 160 persons in the sample have cable. The rest of us have Time Warner. Just a little dig at my cable provider, or my cable non-provider. <laughs> 160 of the 250 people have cable and 90 do not. And you're asked to estimate the population proportion of those with cable. You is it clear that in this instance, this proportional data has arrived, has been delivered in the form of frequency information? And in order to convert that frequency information into proportional data, you simply have to divide the number who have cable by the total number of persons in the sample. Yes. Which in this instance I believe it is 0.64. This is the same as if I were to say to you I have uh, I bought a pack of gum with five pieces of gum in it. I ate three pieces of the gum. What proportion of the pack have I eaten? I've eaten three out of five sticks. That, uh, that is, I've eaten three-fifths of the pack. Yeah. The number eaten divided by the total number. Here we have the number who have cable divided by the total number of persons in the sample. Are there any questions about question five, or four, rather? <laughs> what I'm going to do is go through this, and uh, I'm going to go through one question and ask you consistently if you have questions about another question. <laughs> question five. 
a random sample of a thousand Texas voters is asked who they will vote for in a state election. 50.5% say a Democrat, the Democrat candidate, and 49.5% say the Republican candidate. Estimate the population proportion associated with the Democratic candidate. <laughs> Here, the information is a, has been delivered to you in the form of a percentage. You're told that 50.5% of the sample indicate they will vote for the Democratic candidate. You have to convert that percentage into a proportion, which in this instance is 0.505. Are there any questions about, com first of all, well, let me just ask, are there any questions? I do want this reflected on the evaluation of the course that the instructor provides enlightenment, instant enlightenment. Okay, question six. A random sample of 100 Texans is asked whether they support a referendum limiting the sale of firearms. And this is horribly uh, unrealistic because in the question, 40.5% say yes. They ask me a lot of times. And 59.5% say no. Estimate the population proportion in support of the referendum. Once again, the information that you're looking for has been delivered to you in the form of a percentage. 40.5% of the sample apparently woke up in that heady state close to Nirvana and on that day said they would support such a referendum. Um, you simply have to convert that percentage information into a proportion, which here is 0 0.405. Yes. If there were no questions on question 5, I presume there are none on question 6. Except the absurd prospect of 40.5% of Texans supporting a referendum <laughs> limiting the sale of firearms. <coughs> I need my Uzi. <laughs> Helps me keep the cattle under control. Question 7. A random sample of 290 Houstonians N is 290. Is asked whether they read an out-of-town newspaper. 55 say yes, 200 say no, and 35 say they cannot read. No. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not reading this question correctly. <coughs> Let me go back to the beginning. A random sample of 290 Houstonians is asked whether they read an out-of-town newspaper. 55 say yes and 235 say no. Estimate the population proportion who read an out-of-town newspaper. In the sample, 55 people indicated they read an out-of-town newspaper. That is, again in this instance, the information, the relevant information has been provided to you in the form of frequency data. And you then have to convert that to proportional data. And here, since you're dealing with those who read an out-of-town newspaper, it's the number of people in the sample who do so, which is 55, divided by the total number of people in the sample, which I believe is then 0.18. Nine seven. Let me well. Let me get rid of that dot at the end. Point one eight nine seven. 
Are there any questions about any of the problems in assignment five? Are there any questions about any of the material uh, that we've covered since the first exam? That is, any of the material that will be on the second exam? Yeah. Um, if we're kind of having trouble with the um, small hypothesis stuff, like the um, ideas, it's kind of abstract to me. I mean, maybe I'm just. But what's a good way to um, to kind of figure it out if we're having a bit of trouble? Some of you continue to believe that I'm keeping the nuggets of gold to myself. That, some, <laughs> that somewhere I've got a little box of uh, easy to take pills. Um, I'm not sure there is any way easier than the ways in which we've discussed the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is um, a statement of no difference or no significant difference. Uh, in a court of law, as I have repeatedly said, you can distinguish between the assumption that is being tested and what is in the head of the prosecuting attorney. And in the very same way you can, in social research, you can distinguish between the hypothesis that is being tested and what is in the head of the researcher. The researcher may believe, based upon her or his understanding of extant research that young children who watch large amounts of cartoons, cartoon content on television, uh, behave more aggressively than children who watch low levels of that sort of content. That is, the researcher would believe, the research hypothesis would be that X bar high viewing exhibit greater aggressiveness than the average low viewer. Yes? The, this is what the uh, this is what the um, researcher believes, and it's absolutely analogous to what's in the head of the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney believes that the defendant made some critical difference to the stream of events that occurred. But that is not the hypothesis in a court of law that's being tested. The hypothesis that's being tested, the assumption that's being tested, is the assumption of, of innocence. The analog to that in, in uh, social research is the null hypothesis. And the, the simplest version of the null hypothesis is that these two scores will not differ significantly. They clearly will, it's, it's likely they will differ to some degree. It's unlikely that if you sample the group of uh, high viewing, high cartoon viewing children um, and, a, and a group of low viewing cartoon children, that the amount of television viewing by the two groups would be absolutely equal. So the question is not one of absolute equivalence, it's one of difference that exceeds chance, significant difference. So this is a simplest version of the null hypothesis. In this instance, the null hypothesis would be that X bar, the average amount of aggressiveness amongst high viewers, is less than or equal to the average amount of aggressiveness amongst low viewers. That is, the null hypothesis is everything that the research hypothesis is not. But the simplest version of a research hypothesis is that X bar 1 will not equal X bar 2.
whatever those two samples are, males and female, male and female GRE scores, male and female incomes, the SAT scores of uh, white students versus the, IQ, the SAT scores of minority students and so forth. The null hypothesis is then the statement of no significant difference, a statement of equivalence. And it's this hypothesis that is being tested. And if the researcher rejects the null hypothesis, she or he does so in favor of the research hypothesis. Just as in a court of law, if you reject the null hypothesis, the assumption of innocence, then you are doing so in, and, and instead supporting, you're doing something so that because you support, you found evidence to support the what's in the prosecuting attorney's head, and the analog to that is here, of course, the, the research hypothesis. <coughs> Are there any other questions? <coughs> Uh, let me remind you, yes. Um, as far as the proportion goes, <clears throat> and we are, for the decimal points, for the frequency, when we have to convert them to the frequency, is there, are you going to ask us to round off for the frequency, or is, are we just going to, because I noticed that some are um, two places, some are three, and some are four. So do we just write whatever is on the calculator, or would we round off to two places, or three, or four? It depends what, in the end, you have to do. <laughs> That is, if I didn't in in the examples in assignment five, that is in questions four and seven, I didn't round off in the first instance to two places. It simply resolves to two decimal places. And I rounded off to four decimal places in question seven because that is typically the level of uh, detail that, that you need. That is, four decimal places in a proportion is two decimal places in a percentage. And, and typically, that's the, the level that, 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 that we talk at is in, when dealing with percentages is two decimal places which would then require four decimal places in the proportion let me say this however that th it, it is not going to be an issue on the exam you're not going to be required to choose between and I said this on the first exam you're not going to be required to choose between options that vary minimally you're not going to be called upon uh, to choose between you know, 20.6% to 26.6%, 20.5% to 26.5%, and so on. The discrepancies between the answers available will, will be rather substantial. Okay? Are there any other questions? Let me say uh, a couple of things about the second, second exam. Uh, to you and to future generations. Um, you will need to bring with you uh, a number two pencil, a blue scantron sheet, and a calculator. If you wish to bring scratch paper, you can. And if you wish to bring a copy of Appendix A, you can. But the only reason that you would need a copy of Appendix I is to determine what Z-score you need when you're dealing with a 95% confidence level and what Z-score you need when you're dealing with a 99% confidence level. And I presume that most of you can commit those two scores to memory, 1.96 and 2.58. Um, so those are the things that you need. The second thing is that the exam will start at 10 o'clock. Um, and I don't know how much time you will have, but if you have 70 minutes, it will run till 
10 minutes after 11. Uh, it doesn't make any sense for you then to walk in, and I'm not suggesting this happen in this class, but it doesn't make any st sense for somebody to walk in at 10.30 and say, at 10 after 11, I want my other 30 minutes. You know, the, the exam starts at... Uh, did I get the times wrong then, didn't I? It makes no sense. 10 to 11.30. No, I got it right. Um, the exam starts at 10 o'clock, and what you're doing at 10.05 is up to you, whether you're working on the exam or drinking coffee or getting here or, or, or whatever. But the clock is, is ticking. And I say that because two students on the first exam claimed otherwise. Uh, let me as an aside say some of you are graduating this semester and you're happy about it and I have no idea why because it's a bleak market out there. Um, but when you do get that job, what you're going to find is if you're working for somebody like Shell or Exxon or as my daughter is, Dell Computers, the rules are rough. You don't show up, you don't have a job. And so I don't feel at all guilty about saying that the exam starts at 10 o'clock and the meter's ticking. Um, and and the, some of the things I have to say here may just strike some of you as absolutely absurd, but I say them in response to things that, have, things that happened on the first exam. You need to put your, first, your last name first and your first name last on the Scantron sheet. You don't have to put a comma or anything else between the two. Just leave a space. But you then have to bubble in your name as it appears in the, in the block where it says name. And the same is true of your social security number. Otherwise, it gets down for, to me saying, who does this exam belong to? There are no identifying marks on it. Right? Somebody will, six people will come up to me afterwards and say, well, what's the score on it? Is it a good score? Then it's my exam. <laughs> you know, is it a bad? Not mine. The last thing is, just a request, you go over and you buy those Scantron sheets and they're pristine, you know, fresh out of the pack. And somehow when they come up here, it looks like they've been to a rock and back sometimes. That's a problem with scoring. That produces a problem in scoring those answer sheets that I have to then go and resolve. So don't bend, fold, crumble, or mutilate. Isn't that the, the deal that the post office used to ask us to do? And I'm asking the same of you. Uh, are there any questions about the exam or about any of the material that will be on the exam? Hearing none, this auction is declared closed. Let me remind you, let me remind you, now that we're off air, this class will not meet on... Thank you.